I have already mentioned that insight is always connected to one of the three characteristics of the universe. In Pali, the T lakana. T is three lakana characteristics. Now, the three characteristics of the universe are, of course, also our own. We're no different from anything else that exists. And the more we feel and experience that, the more we feel part of everything around us. And I've already mentioned a way of doing that with the elements. The less we will have any resistance or rejection of these characteristics of these laws of nature. Until we feel part of everything, we are bound to feel that we are personally singled out for particular terrible things that are happening to us. No matter what they are, they might not be extremely bad, but they appear to be. Now, the three characteristics, I've already mentioned them, but I'll mention them again. Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta. Impermanence, Dukkha, unsatisfactoriness and substancelessness. Now I've talked a little bit about impermanence and a little bit about dukkha. But since these three constitute real insight, each one of them being the doorway to complete liberation, I want to elaborate on them a little more. Now let's have a look at Dukkha. Dukkha, as I've already said, is our very best teacher, but we don't really believe that. And we certainly don't act it out. What we usually do with the things that we don't like is trying to get away from them as quickly and as far as possible. Our first option is usually blaming someone else, whoever that may be. And then the second option is blaming ourselves. And we exercise those options probably alternatively, sometimes this way and sometimes that way. We have other options which we use. Physical removal, trying to get away from it, and mental removal. That's a very popular pastime. That's our distraction. Movies, television, novels, telephone, chatter, talking to another, and generally occupying ourselves with that what we believe will bring us some pleasant sensation and which, they might, which it might happen, actually, the pleasant sensation, but naturally it's short-lived. <coughs> so we have to really get in there and work at it. And this is the kind of work that most people on this little globe of ours do. The first work we have to do is, of course, to get enough substance to feed ourselves. Now, in some instances, that's not so difficult. In some instances, it's more difficult, depending where we live and who we are. And then the next exercise is trying to get pleasant sensations. And because they are available, and particularly in affluent society, such as this is, there are pleasant sensations to available everywhere, and some of them aren't even so expensive. Some are, but some aren't so expensive. <coughs> when we're very um, cold to take a hot bath, it's not terribly expensive. It's available. And um, we can pick up the telephone and talk to somebody when we're bored. So these things being available, easily available, we don't even think about. We don't even consider the fact that we're constantly trying to escape. 
the escape mechanism that we have already established are so built in and have been so habitual that we don't recognize them anymore. Mindfulness of our daily endeavors will help us to see how often we try to escape. And then the next step is what are we trying to escape from? Nothing terrible may have happened. We may be perfectly all right. We may not be sick. We may have enough to eat and to drink. Nobody's been abusing us. Everything's all right. And still we're trying to escape. Still we're trying to do something. We've been sitting a while, so we need to get out. We've been uh, lying down a while, so we naturally we have to get up. So after we've got up, what do we do? We've got to get a book. So we've been reading a while. Well, then we have to stop that, and we have to get on the telephone, talk to somebody, or we need to write a letter. After we've finished with that, maybe we have to go to the movies, or we have to visit the neighbors. And after we've visited the neighbors, maybe we'll have to, uh, having talked to them, we'll think something up that we can do over the weekend. Then having thought that up, we make the arrangements. Having made the arrangements, the weekend comes about, we'll go somewhere. And so on, day in and day out. Exempt are the hours of sleep, where we escape into dreams. And the other <coughs> hours, which are a little bit exempt, are those that we absolutely have to earn a living. And that's why that's considered to be extremely tedious in most cases because we can't really get away. We're stuck. So with all this that I've just outlined, which is perfectly normal, everybody does it constantly, we have never given it a moment's thought that each single action is an escape mechanism. And we have never given it a moment's thought what we really want to escape from. <coughs> Why do we want to do all these things? Well, there's, of course, only one answer to that. Because whatever it is that we have been doing has not been fulfilling. We're not feeling totally and completely contented. We're not feeling joyous and utterly peaceful. So we've got to do something else. And because we don't feel totally contented, utterly joyous, perfectly peaceful, that's called dukkha. Now, having done the next thing, Again, not, nothing there, not totally joyous, not totally co fulfilled, not totally contented. It's the same thing all over again. So we start the week again, and it starts all over again. And so it goes on. In between, there are pleasant sense contacts. That's not the, uh, uh, counter, the uh, counteraction. But those pleasant sense contacts disappear again. And they do that all the time. So there's a constant search in the mind, what am I going to do next? Where am I going to move to now? What am I going to really un uh, undertake? What's my next project? Small, big, medium, doesn't matter. Something to do, to think about. Or maybe, having done that, lying down to rest. Finished, getting up again, thinking about it. So what we're trying to do obviously, in all this activity, which in some cases is necessary in order to earn a living or to uh, look after the people that are under our care, but all the rest of it is totally unnecessary. After we have looked at that a little more closely, we can see that there is no total <coughs> satisfaction in any of that. And when we look at it again, and really examine each action in, it, in detail, we will see that it's very often done for the simple reason that we want something to do. That's all. And that's exactly what's happening in the mind in meditation. Just thinking for the sake of thinking. There's nothing to think about. I mean, what could there possibly be to think about after having been here since Monday? I mean, it's, every day is the same, isn't it? And uh, nothing has happened. So there's nothing to think about. But the mind does it. It's just in order to think. And that's exactly what we do in our daily lives. 
And the whole thing boils down to the fact that we haven't seen that no matter what we do, it's all Dukkha. We don't want to admit it. We weren't brought up that way either. Nobody is. The whole world tries to pretend that if one does it right, behaves nicely, and uh, makes enough money, and uh, is uh, good-looking enough, or whatever else says uh, on the agenda, Dukkha goes away. Everything be fine. Now, some societies have certain ideas how Dukkha goes away. This one here has a, a great investment in youth and beauty. Well, there are other societies that have on end money, of course. Don't let's forget that one. <laughs> there are other societies that have other investments, but all of them promise, whatever it may be, that if you've got that, dukkha will go away. It's going to be fine. Everything's all right. It's never done it. Nobody's ever achieved it. It's impossible. First of all, nobody can stay young and beautiful forever. And if that was going to take dukkha away, why do these young and beautiful people, uh, don't they have any dukkha? There is no such thing as no dukkha. And the only thing that is worthwhile examining is what is dukkha, actually? What is it? Is it tragedy? Well, it, that is too dukkha. Is it sorrow? Yes, that too is dukkha. Is it sickness? Yes. Decay, disease and death? Yes, all of that. But it's far more than that. It's that niggling feeling inside. There must be something else. I still haven't found it. And that niggling feeling is the one that pushes one from here to there. And it pushes one physically and mentally, of course. And that niggling feeling is actually the truth. That is quite true. If we were just to listen to it, just to that, without explaining it to ourselves, we would be quite near the absolute truth. But what we do with that niggling feeling, we explain it. We start thinking, well, I've got it because my boyfriend has left me. Or I've got this niggling feeling because my meditation doesn't work. Or I have this niggling feeling because I haven't got enough money. Or I've got it because I'm not young and beautiful enough. Or whatever else we have figured out. Or all of them together. So we try to explain, explain it. But that isn't it at all. These are ideas that we have. And these ideas are all based on some input we've had, something that we have believed that somebody told us that we've seen written up that's on the billboards, whatever else we're looking at, the, the uh, commercials on television, all that. We believe some of that. Of course, we think we don't. But that's impossible. We cannot look, listen, and contact all these information bits and pieces without being influenced by them. It's totally impossible. We are influenced by all we see and hear, touch, all we eat and sense, all the things that go on in our lives. We cannot look at a television commercial, and who doesn't, look at it and say, that does not concern me. It's impossible to say that. We may not buy the product that they're offering, but what they're showing there has an insidious effect. And mind you, Madison Avenue knows all about it. That's why they're doing it. And that's why they're getting paid for it. And even without that, even without having to look at that, the insidious effect of the whole of humanity believing the same nonsense enters into one. It's terribly difficult to be an independent thinker. It needs a fair bit of practice. Now, we may already have thought about the fact that this is no good what we're doing, the food is not so good, we'll do something else, the television can be chucked out, we don't really have to listen to the radio. We have, might have thought that already. It still isn't enough. We have to do the opposite. And only then can we slowly and gently see that there is a totally different direction and then we need 
noble friends. Ananda was the Buddha's cousin and his attendant for 25 years, was with them constantly, totally devoted to the Buddha. And uh, it was a contemporary, same age. And one time Ananda said to the Buddha, Sir, a good friend is half of the holy life. The Buddha said, Do not say so, Ananda. A good friend is the whole of the holy life, the whole of the spiritual life. And a good friend is not just somebody that we can call up in the middle of the night because we're not feeling well. That's also a good friend, but that's not enough. A good friend is one who points out the fallacy of our thinking and helps us to think in a different way. And that is usually only done on the spiritual path. Now, whatever name that spiritual path has doesn't have anything uh, to do with it. Names are just uh, some way of uh, identification. So once we have seen that we are very much affected by all that that goes on around us and that none of this is totally and utterly satisfying, we can then investigate inside ourselves when and how we have ever felt completely, utterly, and totally at ease and at peace and have had that inner joyous feeling which is a buoyance, buoyancy and an, an energy, a mental energy, which does not get taken away when outside things are not to our liking. In fact, it has no connection to that. Now, if we investigate that, we will find that there may have been a peak moment in one's life such as um, somebody mentioned today, but these peak moments had some sort of outer trigger to them. And we can't reproduce that outer trigger. So then when we realize that these daily moments don't have that, then we either get resigned to it, or as I've said already, we blame somebody for it. Must have been my parents or my partner or whoever it was. Or we blame ourselves, we're not clever enough. Or we blame the circumstances, it's the government that doesn't know what they're doing. Well, of course they don't know what they're doing. I mean, they're just as unhappy as we are. Why should they know what they're doing? I mean, they don't know any better. So we blame all this sort of thing that's going on out there. Or we try to find something in the world to substitute that what we already have. And nothing has changed. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's all the same thing. So we can start investigating again and have a look again. And if we become mindful and concentrated enough, we will eventually realize that there's constant movement and change, not only in our thoughts, in our feelings, in our body, but wherever we look. No moment ever remains. Every moment is finished. And within all this change, within all this movement, there is enormous friction. And this friction is in our thinking process. And that is the underlying dukkha of existence. And there's nothing we can do about that. It just is. And then, having got this far, but we have to experience it. At this point in time, you can just sort of take it for granted, but you can experience it yourself. But having got this far, the mind might say, oh, I don't like this at all. Dukkha everywhere? That's not what I came here for. I want it pleasant. I want it nice. I'm going to get on with my stuff. But it's entirely different. It's just the opposite. Having seen that, there is dukkha in everything. It's even in eating. One's got to go first digest it and then excrete it. <coughs> There's action. There is sometimes even unpleasant action. I mean, eating is nothing pleasant about it. It's a necessity. Thinking, what's pleasant about it? It's a necessity at times. So having got this far, 
and not rejecting this idea but looking at it saying well if that's the way it is then I am not different from anyone else everybody's got the same dukkha whether they're just knowing about it or not now of course we've got an absolute denial system going that this is so particularly in this society there are some society that don't deny dukkha quite as vehemently as uh, here in this country but the denial system is worldwide because that denial system of the inherent and underlying dukkha of everything is of course on the worldly level and it's only on the spiritual practice that that can be seen and how many people practice not so many so having got this far as seeing that everywhere we look because of the movement there is friction and because of friction there is dukkha and we can't change that in fact we are that <coughs> at that moment we can find a great relief in that because while the friction and the movement is not pleasant seeing it accepting it means we don't have to suffer from it and this is the first second noble truth of the buddha his enlightenment statement and i like to elaborate on that because it's extremely important for any spiritual practice and even more so to find the way out of dukkha the first statement is the one i've already made wherever we look existence means dukkha that's all because of this underlying friction but then <coughs> second noble truth says there's only one cause for dukkha and that's craving wanting the minute the moment we don't like dukkha it means we don't want it and not wanting and wanting is the same thing only different sides of the same coin and the minute we don't want it we suffer from it the minute we want this dukkha which is in here and everywhere to be to disappear and to be sukha in that moment our desire makes us resist that what really is makes us to resist the law of nature and that resistance is suffering you can actually <laughs> practice that quite easily in your sitting position you get a pain in the knee and you don't like it you're suffering obviously now i don't advocate unnecessary suffering but i do advocate becoming aware of what's going on the moment we accept the feeling as an unpleasant sensation nobody there to suffer unpleasant sensations are as plentiful as pleasant ones and as you have already found out in these days here in the course unfortunately we do not have the jurisdiction over them as we would like if we had it we would have only pleasant sensations obviously but we can't do that so they are there the minute we don't like it we would much rather sit without any pain the minute we want it to go away or we would like it to be pleasant the minute we want to have the first jhana no way there's no possibility the minute we are accepting of that what there is there's nothing any more that it hurt is hurting so if we can look at these first two enlightenment statements maybe i'll mention the third and the fourth one too so that there's no mystery about that the third one is that there is liberation and freedom that there is that which is without dukkha which is called nibbana that's just the name and that there's a way to get there which is called the noble eightfold path and that consists of those three parts which i've already spoken about but not of course addressed every part of it which is more conduct our behavior 
and the concentration and wisdom insight, which is the way to the release from Dukkha. Now, again, I have already said that our tranquility meditation, the concentration, is a means to the goal of wisdom insight. Now, when I speak about Dukkha now, that is to lead us to wisdom insight. We've got to look at it in a different way. And in the beginning, when one starts looking at the Buddha's teaching, the intelligent mind will most likely agree. But there is an enormous resistance within to drop all that which one has believed in before, that it's possible to get out of dukkha if one just does it right. Or man might have believed that one can get and that the rest of the world can get out of dukkha if everybody behaves well, if everybody is nice to little kids, if they share the abundance of food and send it to Africa and all the rest of those fancy ideas that we have. No way can we get out of dukkha. Decay, disease, and death are a given. And so are the body pains, the mental pains, the emotional pains, and so is that friction of movement. That friction of movement is what the universe is doing. It's contracting and expanding constantly. Even our little planet is moving all the time. Even though it appears to be solid and nothing is happening, it's constantly moving at an enormous speed. We all know that. Well, we don't pay attention to such things, of course. Everything is moving all the time. And if we once have a look at ourselves, we can see that. Now, we've been here a few days. It just seems like it just started. Now, everything is gone already. And all the things we've done and heard and uh, walked and sat, it's all finished. But that happens from moment to moment. We never seem to really relate to that. Now, the reason we don't want to relate to that is because that our understanding of this substancelessness is clouded over by the solidity appearance. It's actually an optical illusion. And our understanding of impermanence is clouded over by continuity. There's always a new breath. There's always a new day. There's always another thought. So we don't look that all the other stuff's gone. And our understanding of dukkha is clouded over and co completely covered by movement, by moving away, exactly what we do when we get a pain in the sitting. We move. And so, gone. As another one is coming, and we move again. And another one, and we move. So, this keeps going. These are the three ways, anicca dukkha, anatta, impermanence dukkha, and substancelessness. Those three are the, our possibilities our doorways to get to that third noble truth where there is absolutely nothing left of suffering. Each of these doorways has, of course, a special quality to it. Now, Dukkha that I'm talking about, if it becomes wishlessness, no desire, then we can enter through the doorway of dukkha into the realm of no problem. And then when we look at that, we say, well, what do you mean no desire? That's impossible. Everybody has desires. That's true, quite true. But what we can do in practice, and I'm stepping back now from the ideal to that what we can do, look at our desires and see which ones are really worth having which means getting one's priorities straight. The more desires we have, the more difficult life is. 
because first of all they may not be fulfilled they may be fulfilled if they are fulfilled then there's the fear that that what we got we may lose again but while we're having the desire there is real dukkha because there is a reaching out there is that uh, attempt to get and the worry whether one's going to get it now if at this point in time at this moment there's anything in your mind and in your life which is particularly difficult for you and creates dukkha in your life just for one moment drop the wish that it were otherwise just drop it completely for that one moment it just is no dukkha the minute you pick it up again i wish it hadn't happened or i wish it had happened or i wish i could get or i wish i could be or i wish i could become or i wish it would be so and not so that's all dukkha every bit of it and we're so used to having dukkha that we're almost not, not quite but almost incapable of dropping those wishes but if we do it's like getting rid of an enormous burden doesn't mean that we become inactive but we can be active in fluidity without constantly grabbing that what we wish for every single wish is connected with dukkha if i were wishing all the time while i'm teaching that everyone would love it and understand it i'd have dukkha all the time <laughs> <coughs> it means one does the best one can under all circumstances but that's it finished and all this other stuff from the past that's still hanging on that shouldn't have been or all the stuff in the present that shouldn't be or should be otherwise all that clutters up our ability to act in a clear and really concise manner because this clutter in the mind this clutter in our emotions leaves no room for any clarity so if we have anything that's bothering us may it be small too many cars on the road while i want to sleep or a person i want to live with doesn't want to live with me something bigger or whatever it may be anything at all drop it for just one second you're very welcome to pick it up right away again but just drop it for a moment let it go not there finish no dukkha gone it doesn't have to be like that now we always will have though even if we do that there's still our greatest dukkha is still available to us our greatest dukkha which is that second noble truth of craving which also shows itself in wanting this or not wanting that particularly embedded in us is our craving to be or our craving not to be now our craving to be means <coughs> that we have this innate strong in fact overwhelming desire to be here now that strong and overwhelming desire to be here is at the bottom of every problem now it can be the other side of the coin when we get these suicidal ideas that uh, let them see how they get along without me i've mentioned that already but that's the same story it doesn't change anything that it's also i don't want to be here now this overwhelming desire to be here is of course also in the cause for all these fantastic things that people do do to remain alive against at a judgment even and i've even heard that some people have been frozen so that they can after that did so that they can get unfrozen when the technology allows them to be alive again 
this is nothing new. People have always done that. The pyramids in Egypt are an example of that. The, uh, f uh, in China, this fantastic archaeological excavation where <coughs> the 7,000 uh, clay soldiers, life-size, on life-size horses were found, was the attempt of a king to become immortal with all these clay soldiers and clay horses. I mean, it's always been done. Now we get uh, frozen bits of body and that type of thing. It's absurd, huh? And yet we've got it within us. We want to be here. Now again, that may sound and seem as a totally normal and absolutely justifiable desire. It's totally normal. It's totally natural. But it's not justifiable. Because it creates the greatest dukkha that we can ever have. It's the underlying dukkha of everything. Because we can't manage it. We're not going to be here. We're definitely going to die. So we are putting our energy into something which can never happen. And because of that, and everybody knows that, everybody knows underneath that this desire to be here will be thwarted. Something will happen. So because of that knowledge, that underlying knowledge, there is constant fear. Maybe it will happen tomorrow. Maybe they're going to explode an atomic bomb. Maybe there'll be an earthquake. Maybe I'll get cancer. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Constant fear. It's a human condition. Totally unnecessary. If we were to accept the laws of nature as they really are, that birth and death are totally equal, one is not a cause for rejoicing, nor is the other a cause for depression, they just are the arising and ceasing of a manifestation. And when we see it like that and really accept it, then we don't have to be afraid of it. And the fear only arises because we don't like it. We don't like the laws of nature. Now, how silly can one get? We don't like the laws of nature. We've always said, never liked the laws of nature. And we're getting better and better at it and trying to counteract them. And they're doing us more and more harm because we're so good at trying to do something which is totally against nature. So if we look at the laws of nature and say, aha, this is the way it is. And this is why, of course, I've told you to have a look at your own death. <coughs> Visualize it, accept it, or become aware of the fact how much you resist it and reject it. But if we look at it as that is existence and actually come to the point where we can accept it and realize that we're actually dying every moment and coming to life again and accept that as a truth and as our own existence, then life becomes that what it should be, the flowing and fluid flux, which it is, where there's nothing to grasp and nothing to hang on to, where dukkha is, but suffering does not follow dukkha. Dukkha just is, but we don't have to suffer from it. But because we don't like it the way it is, we want to re resist it, we would like it otherwise. Our greatest cravings are three. The craving for existence, the craving for non-existence, which I've already explained, and the other one I've also explained, the craving for sensual gratification. I've already talked about that. These are the underlying cravings of the second noble truth. But each one of our desires, which we have and which create dukkha for us, each one of them is bound up with one of those three. And this is an inside path and something worth contemplating. We have to get it inside from all angles because we're totally out of it. So we need every angle to get in there. If we 
can examine any desire that we have at this point in time and try to connect it to one of the three. The desire, the craving to be, not to be, or sensual gratification. We will see that this always connected with that. Then the do, to be one is the strongest, the very, very strongest. And the one that says the craving to be is the one which is bound up with our vision and imagination of what and who we are, which is, of course, totally wrong, our vision of what and who we are. And because of that vision of what and who we are, that craving to be is always directed into certain channels how things should be for us so that our vision and our image of ourselves is not affected unduly. And since the vision and image of ourselves that we have is not based on a law of nature but only on an idea, it doesn't work. None of these things work. Everything produces dukkha. Now, we always um, think of dukkha as those things which are really tragic. Those, we all know they are dukkha. That's not it. It's that whole underlying facet of the misunderstanding what it means to be a human being. We see ourselves as a personal individual which needs and wants, has an image and a vision of who we are. And this image and vision and who we are is, of course, shared by nobody else. We've only got it ourselves. You ask somebody else and they've got a totally different image or vision. In fact, sometimes when we forget a name and we describe the person, we often do that because we forget names. Not a clue who that could possibly be. A totally different vision of that person. So that needs examination. That is a pathway to see that dukkha need not be resisted and rejected. Nobody needs to be blamed. Everything is just as it is. And everything is within the laws of nature because the laws of karma play a great part in that too. And our only real job in this life is to gain enough insight so that we can remove ourselves in our mental emotional makeup from these constant desires to be, to have, to become, and just use our energy to have a little more goodness in this universe. That's all. That's all that's necessary to do. Now, in the space of doing that, obviously, there are many other things that we need to do, but they're only, by the way, they're not the primary object. When we see that there's absolutely no escape from dukkha, there's an escape from suffering, sure, we don't have to suffer from it, but there's no escape from dukkha. Then finally, one day, will come the realization existence is not really desirable. That doesn't mean suicide by any means. And then we will become ready to gen gently and slowly give up this mistaken idea of who it is that exists. And when we give up the idea who it, who it exists, we will also eventually give up the idea that we want to exist. And as we give up the idea that we want to exist, then the whole of this universal existence appears as a totality in which there is no personality, no personal individual, everything working as one together, and nobody needs to be present in order to make it work. I've said that several times already. It's all going on without us, isn't it? Nobody's needed to make it work. It just keeps going. The sun comes up in the morning and goes down in the evening. The moon comes up. The stars come up. Every day changes. People are working. People are driving their cars. Everything's fine. And this goes further than that. 
This goes into the whole of universal existence. In order to gain insight, we have to relate universality to our own individuality. If we see everything only from our own standpoint of what we like and don't like, we'll never gain insight because it's far too limited. It's far too bound up with sensual desire. What I like and what I don't like will not bring insight. It's only what I personally want. But if I can see this in the greater context of the universal desire, the desire to be, something else will also come clear. The whole of this manifestation is a desire to be. And this is how we came about this time. And this desire to be is that what brings us don't just want to be, we also want to be the way we think we should be. So Dukkha needs to be investigated. It is our greatest teacher and eventually we will see it as the underlying reality of existence. And as we see it as the underlying reality of existence, we will also know then one day that that is all there is. We don't have to be here to experience it. And the Buddha's promise that there is such a thing as Nibbana is of course that which arises in the mind. All great teachers of all traditions have found that which is beyond this manifest existence. They've given it different names different pathways, this one is particularly clear and also particularly well supplied with methodology. We have methods and therefore we can actually take one step after another. Now I have at times here spoken about the final reality. The final reality is that which comes about when we have practiced long enough. In the beginning, look at Dukkha. Look at it and drop the desire that it were otherwise and the Dukkha is gone. Look at all the unsatisfactoriness of life without blaming anyone, least of all oneself. And if we see it clearly, then we also see all our escape movements. And while I'm not saying that we must resist and reject all our escape movements, we will know them to be something that doesn't work. And then it will be more important to go inside of oneself, to find within that which will help us to have the calmness, the joy and the peace, to go into depth and see the reality. We live on, we have two levels of explanation. One is the relative truth where there is everybody an individual and everybody is separate. That's a relative truth and we can <coughs> see that but there is an absolute truth and that is what inside is all about, absolute truth. Enough dukkha for one evening, huh? <laughs> okay, if you have questions, we can ask questions now. <coughs> Are there any realms, like alternatives to the earth realms, where mm. it doesn't exist? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> but there are certainly... <laughs> there are certainly alternative realms, and there, there are certainly some that have much less dukkha. Mm. The Buddha talked about 31 realms of existence, and the human realm is the fifth one from the bottom. So... <laughs> Now, if anybody will ever again wonder why it goes on so terribly in this human realm, they have forgotten what I just said. <laughs> what can you expect from the fifth realm from the bottom? <laughs> <laughs> but every, every one of the realms has dukkha because they're all impermanent. But some of them, the dukkha is so fine and so subtle that it is said that those beings that are in those realms do not practice. 
and then they come back here, and then they got to practice. <laughs> The next one up is the Bhuma Devas, the Earth Devas. So after us come all the come all the Deva realms, but the lowest of the Deva realms are the Bhuma Devas, which are the Earth Devas. They're the ones that are sitting in cabbages. <laughs> <laughs> the ones that were walking around Findon. I mean, some people actually see them, and uh, there are many stories written about them, gnomes and uh, things like that. So uh, anyway, in Pali, they're called the Bhuma Devas. And then come the Deva realms uh, further. And right below us, well, we all know that, the animals. So we have, uh, certainly there are other realms, yes. And the uh, non-returner, the one who is one step before an Arahant, before an enlightened one, has the wish to be reborn in one of the highest realms. That's why he's not enlightened. And then he's got to do the work in the highest realms, in the Brahma realms, and they're said to be so long-lasting and uh, so totally without dukkha that the person who gets there finds it very difficult to, uh, well, the person, the being that gets there, finds it very difficult to practice. And because they're so long-lasting and also have, of course, practiced very well in the beforehand, they, are, they think they're omniscient and omnipotent, and that's why they think they're gods. But they're also impermanent. But this, I, I'm only repeating what's written in the canon. <laughs> yes? Are you saying that we are beings, but we're not two beings who think we are? Or are you saying that yes. we are really not beings? <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's, <laughs> if it's any consolation to you, yes, we are beings. <laughs> but we're certainly not the beings that we think we are. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, there's certainly beings. There's no doubt about that. Um, so are the animals, and so are the devas, and so forth. Um, but we have this mistaken view of a personal identity, the me. And that is the thing that creates all the problems. Because the me has territorial claims on all levels. And they can never be satisfied. It does initially, until one has practiced long enough to find out that that's a mistaken view. So what can be does a being imply that, that it's individual, something or other? There's an individuality to it, yes. That is the reason for actually arising. This being arises because of this mistaken view that there is a person, an in de, uh, identity, and there is a wish to be. Otherwise, no being can arise if there's no wish to be. <laughs> so maybe a bit complicated, huh? <laughs> yes. So then is enlightenment the end of it all, or is it a way of being without dukkha? While still in this body, it's a way of being without dukkha. When the body breaks, well, not without dukkha, without, without relating to the dukkha, there's always a physical dukkha. Yeah. Um, when the body breaks up, that particular being does not arise again. Plenty of others are there. There's no scarcity of beings. But it's the end of it all for that particular being. Well, <laughs> it's, <laughs> there was no big. It's not the end. It's the you can say that it doesn't arise again because the mistaken view that this person personal being is then lost. The illusion is gone. So while the uh, the Buddha was still in his body, he had already attained nibbana at the age of thirty-five. He lived till eighty. Obviously, he was without suffering, mental suffering. After the body breaks up, that is no longer there, that being. He was often asked, a, uh, what happens to the enlightened one after death? And one of the famous dialogues is between Vachagotta, a wanderer of another 
sect and the Buddha. And Vajrayogata came to see the Buddha and said, what happened to the enlightened one after death? Does he exist? And the Buddha said, no. And Vajrayogata said, does he not exist? And the Buddha said, no. And then Vajrayogata said, does he neither exist nor not exist? And the Buddha said, no. <laughs> and he said, does he either exist or not exist? <laughs> and the Buddha said, no. And what you're going to say, now look, I've given you every option. You said no to everything. What is it? Give me a clue. This doesn't seem to work. So the Buddha said, all right, you bring some sticks and make a fire. So he did, made a fire. And then he said, well, throw some more sticks on. He did. And he said, well, how's the fire going? He said, oh, it's going very well. He said, now stop throwing sticks on. No, he stopped throwing sticks on. And then the Buddha said, what's happening? He said, oh, well fire's going out, now it's gone out. Buddha said, ah, has it gone down, up, right, left, forward, backward? He said, no, of course not, it's gone out. Buddha said, that's right, that's it, that's what happened to the enlightened one after death. No more sticks on the fire of passion. The fire's gone out. Nibbana actually, in its literal translation, means non-burning. No more burning of passions. Okay. Yes. And what about the Dalai Lama and how they had that discussion? Yeah, never mind. That's a different tra tradition. I know nothing about it. You've got to ask them. Please ask them. I wouldn't have a clue. I wouldn't have a clue. The Tibetan Buddhism started 1,200 years after the death of the Buddha. And I know nothing about it. This tradition, which is called Theravadan, bases itself upon the Pali Canon, which is the written-down <coughs> version of what the Buddha said while he was alive. Whether it's verbatim correct or not, I couldn't guarantee either. But I know nothing about what they're doing. All I know is that the Dalai Lama is a very, very nice person. <laughs> yes. Well, actually, the, my talk was not about enlightenment, or was it? It was supposed to have been about dukkha, but I'll answer your question anyway. <laughs> I'll tell you a personal experience about that. When the Buddha died, he died in Kusinara, in India, North India, and he was cremated on a sandalwood pile, which is what is done to this day, sandalwood being very expensive and very wonderfully uh, sweet-smelling, when some great uh, spiritual uh, person dies. It's a very, very expensive, so it's very seldom done. Anyway, he was cremated on a sandalwood par, and over that cremation place, a uh, stupa has been built, which is half um, ruined, but half of it is there. And all Buddhists um, of all traditions find it a very important thing to make at least one pilgrimage to the uh, places where the Buddha was born, uh, taught, lived, and died. So um, a large group of people did that in 1987 in conjunction with the first international conference of Buddhist nuns, and there were 80 of us in three dreadfully ramshackle buses uh, going from one of the places to the next. We came to Kusinara, and we went to the uh, stupa, and what you do is uh, a traditional way of uh, revering the, that uh, holy place is circumambulating it with your right shoulder to the uh, holy place. So we did. And I was walking around that uh, stupa, and all of a sudden I smelled wonderful sandalwood. So, and I found myself quite alone. There was nobody in back of me. And so I stopped a moment, and then one of my friends came nearer, a lady from Sri Lanka, and I said to her, 
do you have sandalwood uh, incense with you? And she said, no, I don't have any incense. And I said, can you smell the sandalwood? She said, yes, I can. So we investigated this whole uh, stupa looking for the sandalwood incense, whether somebody had stuck it there on the ground or into We couldn't find any. So then, as we circumambulated again, she was then behind me. We just walked sort of one after the other. I could feel an enormous energy through the soles of my feet, and that's the only way I can describe it. And it was something as if there was, um, as if I was connected to an electric plug. And so I kept walking, and as I came up to the front of it again, I saw all these 80 people sitting down and meditating. So obviously I sat down too to meditate. And there were people there whom I knew very well who had never meditated in their life. In fact, there was a 12-year-old girl there who had also never meditated in her life. And they were all sitting there meditating. And nobody had said a word about meditating. We had gone there in order to go to the stupa and pay our respects to the last place where the Buddha had been alive. And after we'd sat there for some time, people slowly got up. And then some of my friends said to me, this is very strange here. When we were in Lumbini, where the Buddha was born, I didn't feel a thing. But now, here in Kusinara, where he died, I feel this enormous energy. And I said, yes, I do too. And then I thought about it for a moment, and I came up with this explanation, which is a totally personal view. I said, now look, in Lumbini, when he was born, he wasn't the Buddha. He was Prince Siddhartha Gautama. He was not enlightened. But here he was fully enlightened. This was Parinibbana, which means Nibbana without a remainder. And so these other ladies who were Sri Lankan housewives had all felt exactly that same enormous energy which had made them all sit down to meditate because that was the only thing that seemed to be proper to do at that time. Now, I didn't talk to all 80, of course, but all these Sri Lankan housewives there were about 12 of them, had felt exactly that. So it is my personal considered opinion that the enlightenment principle, which the enlightened person then embodies, does not get lost because we have universal consciousness and that is part of universal consciousness and can, if we can connect to it, help us, of course. But within that universal consciousness, Everything exists, not only that. So this is not something what I'm telling you is a personal experience and also a personal viewpoint. It does not have any of the Buddha's teaching behind it. He never said this, what I'm telling you. But I believe it strongly because it's my own personal experience. And it was corroborated by the other women that were there that I was friendly with and talked to. So it, and, and I've talked to other people who have had exactly the same experience at the same place. So uh, it's, it would seem to be a logical conclusion also. Anything else? Please put the attention on the breath for just a few moments. With each breath that you take, imagine that you're breathing into yourself peacefulness. Wherever you think that you can get it from, breathe it into yourself, maybe from the night sky with the stars, maybe from the trees around us, maybe from the stillness in the air, or the mountains in the distance, or just from your breath. Breathe it into yourself. 
Let it settle within. Let it fill you. And on your out breath, think that you're breathing out love from your heart. The warm, embracing acceptance and care. And let that warm embrace of love that you're breathing out surround you in an embrace. Now breathe that love and peace that's within you. Breathe it out to the person next to you. Give it as your gift through the breath that is life and that connects us all because we're breathing the same air. And now breathe that love and peace within you. Breathe it out to everyone here. Let everyone be part of your breath containing love and peace. Fill everyone and embrace everyone. Now breathe love and peace out to your parents. And they too are connected through breath, through air. No discrimination is needed. We are all just part of the whole. And let that part of you, that's love and peace, come out and fill your parents and embrace them with it. Now breathe out love and peace to your nearest and dearest people. You have breath, you have love, and you have peace. Share it. No other reason. 
the more we give it, the more we have. Now breathe out love and peace to all your friends. Let them arise before your mind's eye. Let each one share what you have. Think of the people you know, whom you meet in your daily life. Breathe love and peace out to them. Embrace them with the warmth of your care and acceptance and fill them with peacefulness. Share what you have. Think of all the people that you meet in your daily life. 